Well, glory to God. Sinners of Saints, welcome to a uh, Sunday School edition. I don't have a church. I don't have a name. What? Uh, assembly of Bible-believing Christians looking for people to get I don't know. What, what should we name our church? Thinking about Jason Stambaugh's big old tabernacle. No, that'd be too much flesh. Oh, well. Church names are funny. I see some wild church names out there. The First Apostolic Holiness Grand Poobah Presbyterian Church of your local whatever. You see a lot of names and stuff here on this ministry, folks. I'm just going to I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with you today as we deal with judgment. We're going to deal with judgment. We're going to go over the five judgments on this Sunday school video. If I can calm down here and actually teach, I'm, I'm in a real good mood today because I feel good. Um, I judged myself last year. And I'll share this with you real quick. Um, I lifelong struggled with my weight. And I was up and down and up and down and up and down. At one point, I was over 300 pounds. And I decided to finally judge myself. What does it mean to judge in the Bible? And you guys, go ahead and start turning. We're also going to do the Pat podcast later on this morning. But go ahead and start turning into your Bible as we search the scriptures to find out about five judgments. We're going to talk about judgment, and we're going to start off in John chapter 5, and probably about the, I don't know, let's do the 24th verse, John 5 and 24. You know, last year, I executed judgment on myself. I had to judge a sin in my life, and it was a sin of gluttony. It was a sin of a love of food more than I love the things of God. And it was causing me so much stress and pain. If you go into strong concordance, which I tell you all, you got to get a strong concordance, get you a good KJV Bible, and you've got to study out the word. You know, Strong says that judgment in the Bible means to pronounce a sentence to... Uh, Look at the intelligence of God and what God's word says, and then you get judged by it. You take a judge that sits on a bench. He's under the confines of the law of the land. The legislative bodies got together and voted on a certain number of laws, and that judge is responsible for enforcing those laws. So when a police officer comes by and he, like when I was a police officer for 20 years, I'd find somebody doing something. I'd pull them over and they'd be swerving all over the road. I'd smell alcohol on their breath. Their eyes would be bloodshot and glassy and they'd be stumbling all over the place. Pull them out of the car. I'd have something called probable cause. Probable cause is facts and circumstances that would lead a reasonably prudent person to believe that a crime had been committed. So with my eyeballs, I saw a dude swerving all over the place Bloodshot, glassy eyes, odor of alcohol on his breath, slurred speech, couldn't walk the line straight, couldn't stand up, couldn't put his finger to his nose because he's touching his forehead too much. I had probable cause to believe. I would deliver him to the county jail. A few months later, the judge would judge him by the facts and circumstances, looking at the law that says you're not allowed to drive intoxicated. It usually came with evidence of a breathalyzer. Most people that blew on my machines, they'd blow up over a .08. So all those facts and circumstances, the judge would say, you're guilty. So last year, through forks and spoons and knives and plates and foods and carbohydrates and sugars and breads, and my gut hanging over my britches, I had probable cause to believe I was on my way to an early grave. So I judged myself. If you go to the book of Isaiah, around that 51st chapter, you know, God's telling his people and, and the church, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper, but that weapon called a fork was prospering greatly against me. If, I, if, if, if the fork I was using to make myself overweight and miserable could have given a dollar amount to how much money it was making, making me fat, that fork would have been a multi-bazillionaire, and that fork was a weapon. So I judged a righteous judgment upon myself. So I put that all on me for you to take that to your heart. 
When people say the day, don't you judge me, don't you judge me. Well, I really can't judge you, but I can show you the Bible. So I'm going to show you five judgments inside of the Word of God that you need to know as a Christian. These five judgments start in John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus said in his word, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That is a judgment that comes from our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, Verily, verily, which means truth. We will be judged by ultimate truth. Just like in state statutes, federal law, when I was dealing with those things and writing probable cause affidavits on search warrants and everything else that I was doing, I was taking truth into a matter and there was going to be a judgment by following the law. If the law says you couldn't possess narcotics and I went into your house and found narcotics, guess what? Verily, verily, the truth said you couldn't have them. And Jesus is saying the same thing. I say it's the law. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, which you got to open your ears, and believeth. So you hear the word, you believe the word, you get saved. This is the judgment of your sin. This is, this is your first judgment. You take your sin, everything, gluttony, 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 filthy communication, envy, pride, any sin you want to name, and Jesus said, of truth I tell you, you've got to believe on me. So if you truly believe in Jesus, you're going to withdraw from your sin and you're going to repent. So you first see your sin, that's the first judgment. Is Jesus saying, I say unto you, he that believe on him sent me hath everlasting life. So to have everlasting life, you've got to take the truth of the word of God, apply it to your sin, repent for your sin, Turn your heart to Jesus. Make him your Lord and Savior. Say, I'll follow you because I believe in you. I don't just have a belief there is you. I believe there is a Christ in heaven. So, Jesus said that if you do that, you're not going to pass into condemnation, but you're going to pass from death unto life. The nice part about this is, not only are you going to pass from death unto life in eternity, you're going to pass from death unto life here in whatever small time span you might have from here to the grave. Because that Holy Ghost is going to get on you, that precious, sweet spirit of God. When God, the righteous judge, looks down and sees you acting right and doing right and following him, that's how you get the favor and the grace of God on your life, is when you fall under the judgment of God, Jesus having the ultimate judgment. And we're going to go on and see that here. Now go to 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. I judged myself last year. I'm like, fork and spoons about to take you out to an early grave with diabetes and everything else. You better judge yourself. I judged myself. I'm going to tell you, I had an encounter this week. I, there's a brother in Christ in my life who I, he's, he, he's an older preacher, and I, man, I love this guy because this guy has the courage to judge me. Judge me. Not the ultimate authority judge. He, he, he can't put me in hell and he can't get me into heaven, but he can judge my actions. He can judge my speech. He can judge what I'm doing. So he told me, like he's told me a lot of times over the years, it usually starts with, uh, Jason, I love you, brother. I know, I'm like, oh man, and you can feel it coming because here comes some judgment. I love you, brother, but he said, I got to tell you a few things, and he did. I'm not, I'm not going to share those publicly, but he said one thing. He said, are you angry with anything? And I thought about three things real quick in my life that I got some anger over, and I accepted that brotherly judgment on my life because on the outside appearance, that man was able to look into my life, look into my actions, and show me some things. And I humbly, through humility, because I learned how to judge myself, I was able to humbly accept the judgment of somewhere else. That's where you need to be in the churches. 
with your preacher. If your preacher is preaching the word of God, he is judging. And that judgment sometimes comes in the form of condemnation. And it's not meant to be that way because the Bible is judgmental. This is a judgment on us today that says you got to judge yourself. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So sometimes a preacher, a deacon, a loved one filled with the Holy Ghost is going to come to us and say, I love you, but I got to tell you something. It's the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God that works through people to help us. And we've got to be humble enough to accept that correction. And when we accept that correction, like the other night, I accepted some correction. And I was like, man... And I went down the road and I really thought about it and it changed my life. That was probably the most valuable conversation that I've ever had with that dear brother in Christ. And I severely appreciate him severely. Anyways, but we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So Paul is saying to the church at Corneth, I want you to judge yourself, let's judge each other. Let's not be condemned with the world. Let's stay in the Bible. Because if we follow the judgments of the Bible, there is no room for error. So we got to judge our sin. Then we got to judge our believers' selves. And if we see somebody else falling in a fault, we need to go to them and say, I love you, but I got to tell you something. And you do it out of love. Now, the next one is going to be the believer's works, which is going to be 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. Here on this earth, once we judge our sin, judge ourselves, we're inside the church, we're executing righteous judgments, we're making sure that the word is being preached, the people are being loved on, correction is going out when necessary, we're keeping the flock and fold together, we're working toward, and, 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 and I'm going to insert this in the middle of this teaching, you've, you've got to understand, you've got to have a willing people. For people to follow me, you've got to be willing to hear the word of God, the way that it comes from the Bible. And many churches to, today, if they, if they've got willing people inside of them. And you've got to have a noble cause. That noble cause for me today is serving Jesus because I know I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, baptism of fire. I know how much peace and love I have. The noble cause is for me to come to you and do these social media videos, preach the Word of God, teach the Word of God, love on the sheep, edify the churches, lift up the pastors, and get the work of the Lord done. So I've got a willingness in my heart. I've got a noble cause, but I've also got a vision. Part of the vision here is judgment. I've got to judge myself, judge others righteously to show them the judgment of God, which is the intelligent wisdom of God to give you a vision of you've got to get out of yourself. You've got to get into the kingdom of heaven by obeying the word of God. Is that enough preaching yet? Okay, 5 and 10. For we all, before we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Churches that are healthy preach this. This is the teaching of the Apostle Paul that we are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. None of us are going to appear perfect. There's a, a lot of us preachers, and I, 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 I shared this yesterday with somebody. I said, some of us preachers will be in error, and we will have things in our lives that we probably could have studied out better, could have done better, could have said better. Many of us get afflicted with whims of doctrines and, and Gnosticism and ideologies, but we're going to have to be covered by the blood. And our works, all believers... Works good and bad. So according to the word of God and the spirit of the word of God, when we appear before Christ, we're going to have good works. We're going to have bad works. Those bad works, what could those be? Well, that could be a failure to judge yourself. But there's going to be a reward according to... We're going to appear before the judgment seat that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or or bad. So we could read into that. We could make a commentary of that. But if you judge a righteous judgment under the ministry that I'm preaching, I don't go out into left field about exactly 
the legalistic semantics of what that could be broken down to and then try to tell you whether you should wear a long dress or not or whether you should go drink coffee or not. I don't get into those. We agree on the blood of Christ. We agree on salvation. We agree that we must be judge, judges of ourselves first, getting rid of sin, praying on an altar of prayer, constantly tarrying for the coming of the Lord and doing the work. That is Bible-based preaching. And knowing that we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you go into Revelations and really study that out, there's going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ. The judgment seat looks like it's going to happen before the millennial reign. And then we're going to get into the rest of the judgments here. So, let's recap. you got to judge your sin, whatever you're in. Then you got to judge yourself, everything in your heart and your mind. Then we go and we start judging these righteous judgments on everything in our life, getting prepared to sit in the judgment seat before Christ. So through humility and the washing of the word, every day I'm like, Lord, when I sit before the seat, I, I just show me. And like I put on that reel last night, when I got out in the woods and started praying on those stumps years ago, like those old school mountain preachers had me doing, and I got down and I started praying, Lord, break me in all the right places. And I wept before the Lord on that stump behind my house down there in Tennessee. Lord knows my heart. And I got down there and I just wanted to be broken. And I tell you, that's why I have peace and love and so much joy in my spirit today. Even in the times when times get hard, I can still have the Lord because the Lord broke me. He broke me of pride and he broke me of ego and he broke me of worry and he broke me of... Of, of, of thinking I had to be somebody or something. And he broke me of those spirits of just infirmity that just encompassed around me that I was always listening to. And he broke me to be able to hear his voice and hear his judgment. And hear when Jesus said, I'm going to take care of you. Don't I take care of the birds? And I don't I take care of the flowers in the field? What do you, what, do you think you're, you're not as important as them? And I took that to my heart. And I saw the Bible that I'm going to appear before Christ, and I love him with everything inside of my spirit. The transference of the love, and it comes through the judgment. So we're going to go to Matthew 25, 31. We're going to look at the fourth judgment. Matthew 25 and verse 31. These pages together. Now this one here says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on the left. Everybody that is prepared, everybody that had been judging their sin, they got their life right with Christ. They were following him. They were repenting. They were conducting themselves, assembling themselves together with other believers. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled, filled with the presence of God. Ready and prepared in their hearts. They're going to be the sheep. The goats are going to be the ones that refuse judgment. Refuse to accept Christ as their Savior. Refuse to truly believe that all this was coming. Refuse to hear the preachers when we say there's five judgments are coming. Jesus is the righteous judge. When we say that Jesus is coming back to make war on the sinners, those that, that refuse to hear anything about the book of Revelation or actually study their Bible, which is heartbreaking. See, I don't preach it from a form of, I'm so much better than you. Look at what's going to happen to you, sinner. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus simply said he's going to set the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And he's going to say things to them and he's going to judge them. And after he judges them, he's judging them on their works, how they took care of what the Lord gave them to do. The rest of this scripture, you can read it on your own, has to do with the works, the works, the works. And I can't express that enough. I don't preach a works-based salvation doctrine. But I do preach that when you put your faith in Christ and you are truly a believer in Him and that Spirit dwells in you, you're going to do the works. 
But if there's no evidence of the works of being kind to one another and witnessing to people and preaching the word as he had prescribed in the Bible and praying and having communion and having relationship and accepting the sacrifice of the blood, if there's no evidence of those kind of works that comes out of somebody, there's no evidence that you ever believed. So therefore, this is what's going to happen. Then it says, Verse 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Just like a judge that sits on a bench, and I, man, I can't count the times I was in court in 20 years watching this happen. A sentencing hearing where somebody that got convicted for some horrible crime was sentenced to prison for a long time. This is what Jesus is doing, is he is taking the goats, the sinners, the unbelievers, the ones that refuse to execute that righteous judgment upon themselves, and he casts them in to everlasting fire. Now, this is the words of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is not my words. This comes right from the King James Bible. We just read it together, and we'll read it again. This is the judgment on the nations, the nations, including all the people. Now, all the churches, all the governments, all the governmental authorities, you know, any politician, everybody, we're going to be, he's, he's going to separate. And he's going to be looking, were you saved? Were you following him? Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So Christ will execute judgment. Then he's going to impose the sentence, which is going to be everlasting fire on the unbelievers. God's wrath is not revenge. God's wrath upon the sinners and those that don't believe him is a righteous indignation for people that follow the devil who fell from heaven. God could not be a justifiable justice, a justifiable just judge unless there was a penalty for sin. Jesus would have never had to go to the cross if there wasn't a crime committed in heaven. Do you understand me? The crime was the devil exalted himself above God, wanted to be. So the third of the angels that are reserved, according to the book of Jude, in hell right now, awaiting judgment, judgment of Christ. So the nations will be judged. Now the last judgment, judgment number five, you're going to find in the judgment of the wicked in the Revelations 20, 11 through 15. And, uh, and to a believer today or any sinner that I preach to, in the jails, under the bridges, wherever I go, you know, I ask that question, is your name written in the book of life? And a lot of the bigger churches that I attend, the people that I talk to that go to the bigger churches, they don't know what the book of life is. The book of life, when your name is written in it, it means that you have accepted the judgment of God and his word on your life. That if you are not believing in Christ, you're condemned. So you don't want to be condemned. You have a right relationship. But you don't do it because you don't want to go to hell. You do it because you love Christ. And when you convert and you really make a decision for Christ, you'll find love. And, 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 and for me today, it's the love. I serve Jesus because I love him, because I love that Holy Ghost. I love praying. I love going to churches where we can sing songs and just worship God because I like being around other people with their name in the book of life because we have a good old time in church. Now this is Revelation 20 and 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the book, and according to their works, judged. They were judged. So, everybody that rejected Christ during this life is going to be brought to the great white throne judgment. They're going to be judged according to their works out of the books, which is the records of heaven. God's watching the sinners, and he's watching us. And everything's being recorded. Nothing is going to be left out when it comes to the judgment. God's great judgment. I, I, I don't... I really want to nail that home to you. So be careful what you do today. It says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, that judged again, every man according to their works. And how were they judged? The word of God. All the, and look at all the people that the Spirit will have drawn them. And they will have known the things of God. 
And they will have been become a backslider and gone back to the devil and gone back to the world. Because the Bible says it's better to have never known than to taste of the good things of God and then you depart from it. This is going to be a very sad day when the sea gives up the dead and death and hell delivers the dead. Why, that, that the angels that fell with the devil, they're all going to be delivered up to the great white throne. And they're going to be judged by God's word because he's a just God. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So this final judgment is going to be the second death for all the people that were in hell. All the people that perished, they were in the ground, they were in the sea, wherever they were. And it says in verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, back in the book of Matthew, we see Jesus says everlasting fire. That's where we get the fires of hell at. We can't write it out of the Bible. We can't commentate it. We can't get too smart for the flames of hell. I'm showing you the flames of hell, and this is why I believe in them. If your name's not written in the book of life, that final judgment there is going to be an everlasting fire. So are you willing people today? Are you willing to serve Christ? Are you willing to have the love that God has to offer you today. You willing to enter into a noble cause of going to church and being good to your spouse and being a good employee and just doing the right thing? Are, are you willing to enter into the noble cause? And I tell people the most noble cause we can do today as we judge the churches and judge the preachers and judge what's being stated in modern society, I keep it real simple. Jesus died on an old rugged cross. He was put in a grave. He rose from that grave. He ascended to his heavenly father. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you the comforter called the Holy Ghost. He's going to lead you and guide you and comfort you. And that's what we should be doing today is Jesus is preparing that mansion. I just took the pure Bible. And that's preaching and teaching of the word of God. Nothing added to, nothing taken away. There's no opinion in there. That's all black and white. And that reads, th this reads just like a law book. Anybody that's been a police officer, a lawyer, a judge, or anybody in the legal profession, this thing reads just like a law book. But it's just words on a page without the Holy Ghost, without the Spirit of God. So you may say, well, preacher... This all sounds good, the five judgments, what do I do now? Well, I'll lead you as a good shepherd, a good preacher. you got to do some inventory, personal moral inventory of your life. And you got to look around, and you got to put the pride, you got to get broken in all the right places, and you got to say, oh, well, Lord, I've, I've heard the preaching, I feel the conviction in my heart. Put your trust in Jesus. And it's going to be shaky at first, I'm telling you. But keep on trusting Jesus, keep on believing him, keep on reading his word, get you a Bible, and read that Bible every single day. And I tell my followers, daily lifting Christ up, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus every day, daily prayer in that prayer closet, communion with God daily, and read that Bible. You're going to be just fine. Amen. I love you all. Appreciate you. Have a blessed and beautiful week.